I'm talking to Harry Crocker, H.W. Crocker III, author of Robert E. Lee on Leadership. Uh, Harry, based on your last comment, I think it is important to lay out the Southern argument, if you will, for secession. And because I think that gives a context, because what you're saying, I think, in effect, is, listen, uh, I'm Robert E. Lee. I don't support secession. But if democratically, or in other words, if through the electoral process, my own state makes a decision to secede, I am in a sense bound by that and I will respect it uh, and I will fight on the on the side of Virginia against anybody who tries to uh, to sort of overturn Virginia's decision. Now, as I understand it, Abraham Lincoln's case was pretty simple, which was I won the election. Uh, you Southerners don't like the outcome of the election. I haven't actually done anything. In fact, I haven't even taken office. And yet all these states are already seceding. So you can't have any sort of an electoral democracy where every time the outcome doesn't go your way, you break up the country. Now, if you were Robert E. Lee or if you were making the case for the South, how would you answer that? And what was the Southern kind of frame of mind in thinking right. about all this? They, uh, yeah, well, the, uh, it's interesting because the president of the Confederacy was Jefferson Davis, who was a U.S. senator <laughs> so, uh, for Mississippi. And he followed Mississippi out of the Union for the same reasons Lee did. But there's two important contexts here. Jefferson Davis said, all the South wants is to be left alone. Okay. But in Lee's case, the secession didn't happen all at once. The states of the lower South came out first. Right now, in in Virginia and the Upper South, those states did not leave at the same time. They did not leave immediately. But what tipped them over the edge was when Lincoln said he wanted to raise troops from the Upper South to put down the insurrection in the Lower South, and that's what brought things to the in the in say like Virginia brought them to the boil. And they no 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 no. I mean, we would like to negotiate a compromise here. But we're not going to go to war against our sister southern states. And that, that again, is sort of the Lee position. So the, for the upper south, it would really was a matter of, all right, look, we'd like to work this out. But if it comes to coercion, we're out. We're not going to, we're not going to fight those southern, the lower states. But lower states, it was just like, look, we entered into this, this pact voluntarily. We're getting the hell out of here. Just like South Carolina tried to secede, you know, over the tariffs in 1832. And Jackson stopped them. <laughs> um, and there was uh, rumors of secession in uh, New England during the War of 1812 because they didn't support the War of 1812 because it interfered with, well, they had several reasons. One was they had big trade with England. They thought France, Napoleonic France was there. France was the enemy, not Napoleonic France. Um, so that, I think, is it. And again, it comes down to, is this a union that states voluntarily enter into and can, again, leave not... I think the, the, the way you can say it's not irresponsible is that the state governments are leading them out. And it's not like a secession movement like, uh, you know, in Portland or Seattle or something like <laughs> block the scarcity of a Marxist, you know, republic. This is why Lord Acton, actually, who's the fellow who gives us the phrase that absolute power perhaps absolutely, he actually corresponded with Lee immediately after the war. And he said that he mourned for what was lost at Appomattox, more than he rejoiced for what was won. I forget what it said, Waterloo or Agincourt. But, 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 and the reason was this. He thought that secession was a check on the federal government, a necessary check on the federal government. The federal government had to moderate its course if it couldn't maintain a willing union of the states. If California, Virginia, or Mississippi, or at least said, we're going to leave if you do that, the federal government then had to like, well, I guess we won't do that necessarily, which is a, is a great point that which no one considers it anymore. If you think about secession as a check and balance on the federal I mean, government. Yeah, Acton was, of course, a great apostle of liberty. He thought he's yeah. sort of a libertarian hero. So what you're making, the point you're making is that while today a lot of people think of the Southern position as totally reactionary, you had prominent liberals, liberals in the old sense from Europe who looked over the pond and go, we're actually our sympathies are with the South and, and, and not. And, and Lincoln, by the way, knew this and he was worried about it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, all this there's more on the on the liberal point. There's more. There's even more to that. I mean, the South was free trade. That was one of their objections. They hated the, the protectionism of the North. They hated the tariffs. In the um, Confederate Constitution, which is very close to the U.S. Constitution, the president is term limited. He only run once. He has one. He has one term, <laughs> and then he's done. Um, it did not reopen the slave, the national slave trade. I mean, a lot of it, it's a very limited. And this is actually a problem for Jefferson Davis fighting the war was that the, his authority was so limited by the states. He had a lot of trouble actually <laughs> organizing these fractious states made up of equally fractious sort of rights driven individuals in the South that it wasn't, uh, it was hard to, to, um, to get them all on the same page often. I mean, the Georgia militia often wanted to attend Georgia. You know, not going to, not going to, to Texas or someplace. And so, right. Uh, they, they definitely guarded their, their prerogatives, to put it that way. Well, guys, you can see just from this brief conversation what a kind of universe of knowledge opens up when we talk to Harry Crocker here. There's just a lot there. And this is a wonderful book, Robert E. Lee on Leadership. Harry, as always, great pleasure to see you again and really fun having you on the podcast. Thanks so much. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com. Guys, I'd like to invite you to check out my Locals channel. I post a lot of exclusive content there, including content that is censored on other social media platforms. Also, some personal content that I typically don't share on social media. So on Dinesh, you sort of get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a weekly live Q&A every Tuesday tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic is off limits. I've also uploaded some cool films to Locals, both documentaries and feature films, my films, and also films by other independent producers. We're in the process, Debbie and I, of editing our new film. It's coming out in October. I'll be giving you the inside scoop on locals and also footage in locals that you won't see elsewhere. If you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch all these films for free. Check out the channel. It's dinesh.locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's dinesh.locals.com.